What you are witnessing is an assessment of a fellow atheist debate performance. It is not the debate performance itself. The gentleman shown on the screen, William Lane Craig on the left and Frank Zendler on the right, debated atheism versus Christianity back in 1991. In this video, I am going to almost entirely ignore Dr. Craig's comments in the debate because I, along with many others, have already assessed his arguments elsewhere. Instead, I will focus on the prepared opening statement delivered by Frank Zindler. I'm going to do this for two reasons. First, it was prepared in advance, so it should show him at his best. And second, because in my experience as a debater, opening statements are often a good predictor of who ultimately wins a debate, however you define the word win. This video is divided into three parts. The first part, which consists of a single slide, provides an overview of the debate and an introduction to the atheist debater Frank Zendler. In the second part, I will analyze the organizational structure of Zendler's opening statement, as well as how much time Zendler allocated to each section of his speech. Finally, in the third part, I will assess the content of Zendler's opening statement itself from both logical and rhetorical perspectives. My intent is to be not only fair, but charitable. Where appropriate, I will try to steel man his arguments. Frank Zendler is all but dissertation, or ABD, in neurobiology from the State University of New York at Albany. He is a former university biology instructor and a professional linguist with a specialty involving ancient languages. He has also held a variety of leadership roles with American Atheists, including editor of American Atheist Magazine, director of American Atheist Press, and interim president of American Atheists. Mr. Zindler is the author of numerous articles and several books on atheism and related history, including a special annotated edition of Part 3 of The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. He is a member of several learned societies, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the New York Academy of Science, the Society of Biblical Literature, and the American Schools of Oriental Research. Mr. Zindler is also a nationally recognized figure in the ongoing debate over creationist pseudoscience and evolution. If you watch the video or read the transcript of the debate between William Lane Craig and Frank Zindler, the first thing you'll notice about Zindler's speech is that Zindler doesn't signpost his main points in his opening statement. He leaves it up to his opponent and to the audience to interpret what those arguments are. I have attempted to reverse engineer an organizational structure for his opening statement, complete with section and subsection titles, and I've tried to do so in a way that is not only an accurate representation of his speech, but is charitable and even steel mans it. At the highest level, Zindler's opening statement seems to consist of two main sections, the introduction and his evidence against Christianity. I'll expand this organizational structure in later slides, but for now I want to focus on this level of the organizational structure. Zindler's opening statement consisted of 2,668 spoken words. Within, with a 20 minute time limit, that averages out <coughs> to a speaking rate of about 133 words per minute, just barely slower than Craig's 134.7 words per minute. There are two key takeaways here. Number one, both Craig and Zindler speak at a reasonable rate, not too fast and not too slow. And number two, because speaking time is precious, debaters need to make every word count. In my opinion, using up 13% of your words on introductory remarks is too much. He could have cut that down to 5% and used the extra time on his arguments against Christianity or by adding a conclusion. Let's now zoom in one level on the organizational structure of his speech. Let's call this Zoom Level 2. Here we can see the various subpoints which support each of his two main sections. In his introduction, Zindler first tells a funny joke and expresses gratitude for the opportunity to participate in the debate. Next, he responds to Craig on the definition of atheism. And then third, he responds to Craig's moral argument. Now in this debate, Craig gave his opening statement first, followed by Zindler. In a debate format like this, where both debaters give 
opening statements, there is a temptation for the second speaker to devote part or all of their speaking time to rebutting the first speaker's opening statement. I think that is a mistake for two reasons. First, any time spent by the second speaker talking about the first speaker's points means less time the second speaker has to develop his or her own points. Second, in this format, we essentially have two debates taking place in parallel. The first debate is a debate about the position defended by the first speaker. The second debate is a debate about the position defended by the second speaker. The second speaker should utilize every second of their opening statement to develop their defense of their position. Now, this gets a little complicated when you have someone like Zindler who defines the word atheism as the lack of belief in God. Anyone who has followed me for a while knows that I think debating semantics is a colossal waste of time, and so I'm not going to wade into the debate on the definition of atheism here. Instead, I want to put that debate aside and focus on the concepts behind the labels. Zindler says he is, quote, without God belief, end quote. Fair enough. Labels aside, Zindler's comment implies not only that he lacks belief in the proposition God exists, but also that he lacks belief in the parallel proposition God does not exist. And if the topic were on the existence of God, then I would say that someone like Zindler should give the second opening statement and use their entire opening statement to respond to their opponent's opening statement. But the debate topic is not the existence of God, or at least not just the existence of God. The debate topic is atheism versus Christianity. Putting aside the semantic debate about the def definition of atheism, Zindler clearly does have a belief about Christianity. He believes the proposition Christianity is false. Therefore, in his opening statement, we would expect him to defend that proposition with arguments or reasons. And indeed, he does precisely that. But before he states his arguments against Christianity, he first needs to define what he means by Christianity. And yet he doesn't do that. While he offers a definition of atheism, he doesn't offer a definition of Christianity. With the debate topic of atheism versus Christianity, this seems like an odd decision. He could have quoted, or at least mentioned, one of the various Christian creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, or the Athanasian Creed. Not only is this odd, I also think it's a bad decision. Without offering his own definition of Christianity, he in effect concedes the definition to his opponent. That in turn runs the risk that his opponent will object that Zindler's arguments aren't relevant to Christianity. And indeed, that is precisely what Craig does argue in his rebuttals. Anyway, at Zoom Level 2, we get the basic idea of Zindler's case against Christianity. He thinks that facts from what I'm calling the sociology of religion, astronomy, chemistry, biology, and cosmology show that Christianity is false. I'll talk about each of these scientific observations in a moment. For now, however, I want to compare Zindler's choice or selection of anti-Christian arguments to the list of such arguments as were available to him in 1991. On this slide, I've listed many of the major objections unique to Christianity. Two caveats are in order. First, I don't claim that this is an exhaustive or a comprehensive list. Second, just because something is listed here doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with it. For example, I am more inclined to say that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is unintelligible then I am prepared to defend the claim that it is self-contradictory. Anyway, all of the objections on this slide that I've listed were known objections when Zindler debated Craig in 1991. As we just saw in the previous slide, however, Zindler's case against Christianity consisted solely of what I'm calling scientific objections. And again, part of the reason I say that is because I'm inclined to categorize the argument about the variability of Christianity as an objection from sociology, which is considered one of the social sciences, and so counts as a scientific objection in that sense. But leave that to the side. Whether you agree with all 
some or none of the objections shown on the slide, I invite you to take a moment and think about how you would rank them in importance. Once you've got an idea in your own mind about what you would consider the most important objections for a critic of Christianity to present, compare them to Zindler's list of objections. Were Zindler's objections really the most important? Were they the best use of his time? Here I'd like to suggest two strategic blunders by Zindler. First, my number one objection, no pun intended, to Zindler's choice of topics would have been and is the objection, God did not raise Jesus from the dead. Christianity stands or falls with the resurrection. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. All the other objections to Christianity are of secondary importance compared to that singular objection. Zindler's failure to say anything at all about this in his opening statement is a glaring omission. Second, I think Zindler should have presented an argument from evil. This might seem like an odd thing for me to say because in his introduction, Zindler said he is without God belief, which implies that he does not hold the belief God does not exist. And, and in fact, he didn't claim to believe God doesn't exist. So why do I think Zindler should have used the argument from evil? Because, contrary to what he said in his opening statement, he apparently does believe God doesn't exist. At the end of his second rebuttal speech, Zindler raised the argument from evil. In other words, Zindler contradicted himself. If he thinks the argument from evil is a good objection to Christianity, then why not raise it in the opening statement instead of waiting until the second to last speech in the entire debate uh, from his side? How I assess arguments and debates. I assess arguments from two perspectives. The first is what I'll call a logical perspective, which is an objective assessment of whether the argument is sound, if it's a deductive argument, or strong, if it's an inductive argument. And secondly, from a rhetorical perspective, this is my subjective assessment of whether the argument is likely to be persuaded, persuasive to an audience. Now, for each of these two perspectives, I use the same rating scale, which is from very negative to very positive, and I indicate that with down arrows and up arrows. The worst possible rating being three down arrows and the best possible rating being three up arrows. This slide shows the organizational structure of Zindler's speech again, but I've replaced the columns that had the number of words and the percentage of the total number of words with new columns for logic and rhetoric. This is where I will put my assessment as we work our way through his opening statement. Zindler started off his speech with a joke and an expression of gratitude. There's no argument to assess here, so I put not applicable in the logic column. I thought the joke was funny and the expression of gratitude sincere, so I give Zindler two up arrows from a rhetorical perspective. Moving on to the definition of atheism, Zindler denied, while Craig affirmed, that atheism makes no claims. What is important to notice here is that both Zindler and Craig spoke as if there were an objective fact about the definition of atheism. In effect, Zindler said, my definition is right and Craig's definition is wrong, while Craig, in effect, said, my definition is right and Zindler's definition is wrong. But there is no such thing as a platonic form of the definition of a word. In other words, there is no mind-independent or stance-independent fact of the matter about how to define words. Rather, the definition of words is relative to a group of language users. Craig is correct that, within the Academy of Professional Philosophers, the dominant view is that atheism is the proposition God does not exist, and so an atheist in that group of language users is a person who believes that proposition is true. But contrary to Craig, that is not the only definition adopted by professional philosophers. The word atheism is polysemous even among philosophers. Craig knows full well that philosophers of religion like Antony Flew, followed by the late Michael Martin and the still living Keith Parsons, 
adopted essentially the same definition as Zindler. Furthermore, from a rhetorical perspective, I think it's a bad look for Craig to be telling Zindler, a spokesman for American atheists, how to define the word atheism. Imagine if the Dalai Lama had debated Craig on Buddhism versus Christianity, and the Dalai Lama attempted to correct Craig on the correct definition of Christianity. If you can understand why the Dalai Lama would look bad doing that, then you can understand why it's a bad look for Craig to tell Zindler how to define atheism. From a logic perspective, I gave Zindler one down arrow. I did so for two reasons. First, his argument from etymology is irrelevant. Even if he is correct about the original Greek meaning of the prefix a, the fact is that the meanings of words and prefixes change over time. Second, as I mentioned a moment ago, Zindler's entire point presupposes linguistic or semantic objectivism, which I think is nonsense. I consider this second point a much more important point than my comment about the etymology of the word atheism. From a rhetorical perspective, I wasn't entirely sure how to rate this. On the one hand, I suspect that the average non-philosopher's definition of atheism, at least for people who don't call themselves atheists, is much closer to the definition used by Craig than the definition used by Zindler, uh, and uh, also the definition used, used by uh, many self-identified atheists. And so from a purely usability perspective, Zindler's definition creates an unnecessary distraction from the more important topics, which are, does God exist, and is Christianity true? On the other hand, I go back to the fact that Zindler was speaking on behalf of American atheists. It seems to me that there is a general principle that non-theistic organizations, much like their religious counterparts, get to define their terms and their membership, just as the, say, Catholic Church gets to define what it means to be Catholic, I think American atheists gets to define what it means to be an atheist. Out of a spirit of charity, then, I decided to give Zindler one up arrow. Before I move on, I want to make one point to avoid any misunderstandings. My personal subjective preference is that atheists would define the word atheist as someone who believes there is no God, and instead use the alternative word non-theist as an umbrella term. I think the alternative approach, the one favored by Zindler, creates a lot of unavoidable confusion. I know that many self-identified atheists disagree with me about that, and that's okay. The only reason I even mention this is to underscore the fact that while I give Zindler an up arrow on rhetoric, that in no way represents my personal position on the definition of atheism. Let's next turn to Zindler's comments in his opening statement about atheism and morality. I think this was by far the worst part of his opening statement. To explain why, I first need to review what Zindler was responding to. On this slide, I am displaying Craig's moral argument as he stated it in his debate with Zindler in its logical or standard form. Before I critique Zindler's response, I'd like to make a few observations. <clears throat> First, the argument is logically valid, meaning that if both premises one and two are true, then the conclusion must be true. Therefore, if Zindler wants to defeat the argument, he must tear down Craig's reasons for believing one, two, or both one and two. He doesn't have to show that one or two are false, but Zindler at least needs to rebut the reasons given by Craig in support of at least one of the two premises. Second, Craig's argument is about moral ontology, not moral semantics, not moral epistemology, not moral psychology, not descriptive ethics, and not biblical morality. Someone might object to Craig's moral argument by appealing to the semantic facts that a moral goodness does not mean identical with God's nature, and b, moral duty does not mean commanded by God. However, such an objection is irrelevant because the argument is not about the meaning of moral words. The epistemological fact that atheists can recognize, know, or have justified belief in moral claims is irrelevant because the argument is not about moral epistemology. 
explaining moral beliefs as the byproduct of evolution is also irrelevant and for the same reason. The psychological fact that moral emotions like shame and disgust have a biological evolutionary origin, origin is not relevant because the argument is not about moral psychology. The descriptive fact that atheists can be just as moral as theists is irrelevant because the argument is not about descriptive ethics. And finally, objections to biblical morality are irrelevant because the argument isn't about the Bible. It could be the case both that biblical morality is objectively false and that God exists. In Craig's argument, the word objective means ontological objectivity, not epistemological objectivity. When he says that positive moral values like love, generosity, self-sacrifice, equality, mercy, justice, love, and forbearance are objective, he means that such values are not reducible to the subjective attitudes, beliefs, desires, emotions, intentions, or motivations of human beings. Now that I have clarified what Craig's moral argument does and does not say, let's turn to Zindler's response. In reply to Craig's moral argument, Zindler objected that the argument commits the circumstantial ad hominem fallacy. This is nonsense. Zindler is flat out wrong. The expression ad hominem in Latin means to the person. An ad hominem argument is an argument where the person making the argument attacks the other person in some way, such as their intelligence, their appearance, their political party, their religion, motive, and so forth, instead of attacking the argument itself. Circumstantial ad hominem arguments have the following logical form. Premise one, per person P makes an argument X. Premise two, person P has a vested interest in X being true. Three, therefore X is false. Now compare that argument to that argument form to the logical form of Craig's argument. When you lay out both arguments in their standard form, it is obvious that Craig's argument is not a circumstantial ad hominem argument. Zindler should be embarrassed for making such a terrible objection. As Zindler rightly notes, most people are, quote, appalled at the idea of moral anarchy, end quote. What Zindler fails to acknowledge is that many people link atheism with moral anarchy. So how then does Zindler address that concern? He says, quote, atheists, just like all of you and other people in the world, have to depend upon man-made systems of ethics, end quote. He doesn't seem to recognize that in the minds of many people, man-made systems of ethics are no better than moral anarchy. I can't imagine any Christian anywhere or any other kind of theist being convinced by Zindler's response. One final point. Although Zindler has not contradicted himself, I think the end of his response is odd when you compare it to what he just told us about his definition of atheism. Remember that Zindler defines the word atheism as without God belief, which implies that an atheist lacks the belief that God exists and lacks the belief that God does not exist. But in response to Craig's moral argument, Zindler now tells us that, quote, atheists know that all ethical systems are made by human beings, end quote. I want to be, I want to be clear here. If we define the word God a certain way, it is logically possible to lack belief in God's existence, lack belief in God's non-existence, and at the same time believe that no ethical system depends on God. But there is at least a tension here. Zindler's atheists might be, quote, without God belief, end quote, but Zindler's atheists are not without, quote, belief about God's irrelevance to ethics, end quote. And actually, I shouldn't put that last part in quotes because that's my paraphrase, not Zindler's exact words. I think one could also press Zindler on how precisely atheists know that all ethical systems are man-made, 
but I've already spent too much time on morality, so I'm going to move on. For the reasons just stated, I give Zindler's objection three down arrows from both a logic and a rhetoric perspective. Let's move on then to Zindler's scientific objections to Christianity. Zindler's first reason to think Christianity is false is, in his words, quote, the great variability of Christianity, end quote. What does that mean? Zindler identifies three distinct types of variability. First, he says, there is variability among Christians, uh, Christian individuals, and Zindler specifically makes a point of listing Hitler, Jim Jones, and David Koresh as Christians. Second, he says there is variability among Christian denominations. He lists Mormonism, Christian science, Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and a thousand Protestantisms, end quote. And third, he says there is variability among doctrinal beliefs, predestination versus no predestination, faith versus works, and so forth. I have several problems with this part of Zindler's case. First, I wonder what precisely Zindler thinks he is accomplishing by claiming that Hitler was a Christian. No Christian is going to agree with that. In fact, I'm a fellow atheist and I don't agree with that. By making such a claim, Zindler simultaneously manages to anger Christians and make himself look foolish. Second, it is rather one-sided for Zindler to list bad Christians like Jimmy Swagger and Pat Robertson who have done bad things without also listing Christians who have done good things. Even if one thinks Hitler, Jim Jones, and David Koresh were Christians, they are not a representative sample of Christians in general. Third, and most important, it's not clear how the variability among Christian individuals is supposed to be evidence against Christianity. Turning to his second type of variability, variability among Christian denominations, I am much more sympathetic to Zindler here. But Zindler never actually gives a reason to think that the variety of denominations is evidence against Christianity. Maybe he thought it was obvious. In any case, his speech would have been stronger if he had actually stated the full argument. Finally, third, variability among doctrinal beliefs. I think this was his strongest point. If the purpose of life, according to Christianity, is to increase in the knowledge of God, then it is very surprising that major Christian denominations disagree with one another over what is required for salvation. As Zimler said, quote, we have those with, who go with faith versus works, end quote. In conclusion, while Zimler spends an entire paragraph describing the great variability of Christianity, he does not use a single sentence to describe the Christian prediction he thinks is falsified by that variability. Therefore, in a spirit of charity, I propose steel manning Zindler's first point as follows. Christianity predicts that Christian teaching would be unified on what is required for salvation. Allow me to explain. When I say Christianity predicts something, such as Christian teaching would be unified on what is required for salvation, I am not claiming that the Bible says this. It doesn't. Nor am I claiming that church tradition says this. It doesn't. Rather, I am saying that if we look at the definition of Christianity and many of the various Christian creeds, one of the key points seems to be that Christian that, sorry seems to be that Jesus was needed for our salvation, that is, to save us from the consequences of sin, which include death and separation from God. Now, on the assumption that Christianity is true and death and separation from God are real possibilities, we would expect that Christian, Christian churches would agree on what is required for salvation. The evidence, however, reveals that Christians themselves are divided over what is required. Some say salvation comes from faith alone, while others say that salvation must be accompanied by good work. In fact, this was one of the main disagreements that arose during the Reformation. Now, obviously, this point doesn't disprove Christianity. It is possible that Christianity is true, and Christians disagree over what is required for salvation. But this fact is more likely on the assumption that Christianity is false than on the assumption that Christianity is true. 
Therefore, my review of Zindler's first argument is mixed. If I consider only his version of the argument, I have to give it a negative logical rating because he never actually states Christianity's prediction. For that reason, I gave this argument one down arrow, but you'll notice that I put one up arrow inside parentheses. That's because I think that if you steal man Zindler's argument, as I just did, it is a logically correct inductive argument. It's not a killer argument, uh, but it is a strong inductive argument. Turning to rhetoric, I gave Zindler a lukewarm positive rating of one up arrow. I would have given him a higher rating, but I think his decision to say that Adolf Hitler, Jim Jones, and David Koresh were Christians damaged his credibility. If he hadn't have done that, I would have given him at least two up arrows. Let's move on. Zindler's second line of scientific evidence is taken from astronomy. According to Zindler, the Bible teaches a three-story universe consisting of heaven on top with a flat earth underneath heaven and hell underneath the earth. For example, according to the story of the ascension of Jesus, 40 days after his alleged resurrection, Jesus went up into the clouds to heaven. Zindler also cites the Gospel of Matthew, book, uh, sorry, chapter 24, verses 29 to 31, as further evidence of a flat earth. According to Zindler, the book of Matthew implies a flat earth because otherwise it wouldn't be possible for all of humanity to see Jesus at his second coming. But, he says, the evidence from astronomy shows that a spherical earth is flying through outer space as it orbits the sun, and therefore the Bible is wrong. How should we assess this argument from a purely logical perspective? One question is whether the Bible teaches or implies a three-story universe. I'm not a biblical scholar, so I don't consider myself qualified to answer that question. I do know that Zindler's claim isn't crazy, no less than the German theologian Rudolf Bultmann thought the same thing. For the sake of argument, then, let's assume that Zindler is right. The Bible describes a three-story universe. What then? How do we go from the Bible describes a three-story universe to Christianity is false? One answer, an answer I will call A1, and an answer that I think even Zindler would reject, is that Christianity stands or falls with the inerrancy of the Bible. There's just one problem with that answer, however. It's either question-begging or false. If you define the word Christianity in a way that requires biblical inerrancy to be true, then the answer works, but you've begged the question against all the Christian churches which do not affirm inerrancy. If, on the other hand, you do not build inerrancy into the definition of Christianity, then you avoid begging the question, but at the same time, A1 is false. The second answer, A2, is closely related to the first, but independent of the first. <clears throat> According to A2, if the Bible is not credible on scientific matters, such as the shape of the earth, it is not credible on theological matters, such as God raising Jesus from the dead. Unlike A1, A2 doesn't assume a simplistic, binary, all-or-nothing approach. A2 recognizes that credibility comes in degrees. A2 says that the less credible the Bible is when it comes to science, the less credible it is when it comes to theology. My own view is that, as a general principle, A2 is false. The Bible doesn't seem to present itself as a science textbook, so, speaking generically, any scientific inaccuracies that may or may not exist do not necessarily falsify Christianity. And again, at this point, I'm assuming that biblical inerrancy is not an essential Christian doctrine. But this is not to say that A2 is completely without merit. If A2 works at all, it only works in situations in which the Bible claims, either explicitly or implicitly, something which is scientifically inaccurate and which is somehow essential to Christian doctrine. Let's see if we can steel man or revise A2 into something plausible. According to A3, the ascension and perusia, or second coming, of Jesus are essential Christian doctrines. Furthermore, these doctrines presuppose a three-story universe. Therefore, if the three-story universe is wrong, any doctrines based on it must also be wrong. Now, there is, uh, I'm not going to read all of the verses that I have on the screen here, but there are a number of verses in the Bible which talk about the ascension 
and the Perugia. Um, and there are also, uh, there's also a lot of support from uh, historic Christian creeds. Scholarly support for Zimler's argument can also be found in the work of the late New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann. I'm not going to read the slide to you. If you're interested in the full quote, you can pause the video and read it for yourself. Instead, I'd like to take just a moment and think about Ludemann's objection here. It seems clear enough that belief in the ascension and the second coming of Jesus is essential Christian doctrine. But a source of doubt for me about Zindler's and by extension Ludemann's argument is that I am not sure how to interpret the Bible on this. Why does the ascension depend upon a literal three-story universe? Even if we assume, for the sake of argument, that the Bible does describe a three-story universe, why can't that be metaphorical? Unfortunately, Zindler doesn't address this possibility in his argument. And so, from a logical perspective, his defense of the argument is, at best, incomplete. For that reason, I rate Zindler's presentation negatively, with a single down arrow. I put a question mark inside the parentheses to, indica to indicate that a steel man version of his argument, perhaps following Ludemann, might be successful. I don't know. From a rhetorical perspective, I also judged the argument negatively, again with a single down arrow. My rhetorical judgments are subjective, so others may disagree with me. But I doubt that Zimler's appeal to a controversial, literal interpretation of the Bible was persuasive to many, and that's why I gave it a negative rating. Let's move on. Zimler's third line of scientific evidence is from chemistry or bio biology or both. I wasn't completely clear on this from his presentation. According to Zindler, there are some Bible passages which teach that blood is what makes something alive, while uh, a lot more passages indicate that it was breath or spiritus in Latin, where we get the word spirit or pneuma in Greek, from which we get the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and pneumonia also, end quote. But, he says, both kinds of passages have been falsified by modern science, specifically biology, because the data shows that life depends upon the chemical marriages and divorces we call metabolism. Again, I'm not a biblical scholar, so I don't have much to say about this. For the sake of argument, I'll assume that Zindler is correct, that a literal interpretation of the relevant biblical passages implies that life depends upon blood or breath. But as with his prior argument, the key question is whether that matters to the truth of Christianity. According to Zimler, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity <coughs> is an essential Christian doctrine. He argues that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, depends on the belief that breath is necessary for life. But I don't understand why the doctrine of the Trinity depends upon a belief about biology. The Holy Spirit isn't defined as a physical living organism. So why can't the imagery of breath be taken as metaphorical? Zindler never says. For this reason, I rated this argument negatively from both a logical and a rhetorical perspective. From a logical perspective, Zindler's defense of his argument is, at best, incomplete. From a rhetorical perspective, I just found the argument entirely unconvincing. Fourth, Zindler argues that Christianity's belief in a savior requires that we are in need of salvation, but salvation requires original sin, which requires a historical Adam and Eve. But, he says, evolution means there was no historical Adam and Eve. Furthermore, he asks, when in the course of human evolution did we get these souls or spirits? Zindler concludes that, quote, evolution is the absolute death knell of Christianity, end quote. These are intriguing and important points which deserve a closer look. On the left, here is Zindler in his own words presenting what I call his evolutionary anti-savior argument, which argues that biological evolution removes the need for a savior. The most devastating thing, though, that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know that Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. 
If there never was an original sin, there is no need of salvation. And if there is no need of salvation, there is no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. So on the right, I've put the argument you just heard into its logical form. My own view is that Zindler is correct that evolution provides a powerful reason to doubt Christianity, but he's at least partially wrong about why evolution is a problem for Christianity. His anti-savior argument fails because premise three is false. Even if there never was an original sin, it wouldn't follow that humans are sinless. Maybe the Genesis story of Adam and Eve is metaphorical, and people need a savior because of their own sins, not because of their own sins combined with the sins of a literal Adam and Eve. Also, premise one might, and I emphasize the word might, be another source of doubt about Zindler's argument. For what little it is worth, my intuitions agree with Zindler. On the assumption that biological evolution is true, it seems rather improbable that, the, that only two Homo sapiens evolved from an earlier hominid species, and then all other human beings in history are descendants of that first human couple. But notice I use the word intuition. In recent years, long after Zindler's 1991 debate, there has been some intriguing research done by a variety of Christian scholars. For example, Dr. Joshua Swamidas, I apologize if I, got his, if I pronounced his name incorrectly, using population genetics and genomics, suggests in his book, his book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, that there was a genealogical Adam and Eve who lived alongside other humans. Another example is Zindler's debate opponent, opponent Dr. William Lane Craig. In his book, in quest of the historical Adam, Dr. Craig argues that Adam was a real historical person, but not as a member of the species Homo sapiens. Instead, Craig posits that Adam lived sometime between 750,000 to 1 million years ago as a member of the archaic human species Homo Heidelberg, Heidelberg, Heidelbergensis. I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. Um, I haven't read any of this scholarship, and so I am not going to take a side here on, on who is right. If it were the year 1991 and I were judging the debate, I would have said I think premise one is true. But in the year 2023, the truth of premise one is now an open question for me. In any case, even if scholars like Swamidas and Craig are incorrect, the argument still fails because premise three is false. As I read him, Zindler seems to give a second evolutionary argument against Christianity, which I will call the evolutionary anti insolment argument. Again, on the left is a video of Zindler in his own words. I think that uh, evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. So consider, if evolution is true and all the evidence of science seems to show quite clearly that it is, then what about this idea of souls and spirits? Even if you ignore my historical analysis as to the origin of spirits, when in the course of human evolution did we get these souls or spirits? Did Neanderthal man have them? Was he capable of going to hell? Did Homo erectus with two-thirds our brain capacity have this? Was he capable of going to heaven or hell? And we can go on back, back to the jellyfish and ask, in which generation did souls come into our, our, uh, our, our toolkit? Keep in mind, the chimpanzee in the zoo is 99% the same as you, genetically. Only 1% of genetic material distinguishes you from a chimpanzee. 1.5% distinguishes you uh, from a gorilla. So why should we have souls and be capable of eternal bliss or eternal damnation and not our close cousins uh, in Brookfield Zoo? So in his own words, let me back up. I'm not entirely sure how to 
uh, fairly represent the the argument that he just stated. In fact, if I'm being candid, I'm not sure if we actually heard an argument uh, as opposed to a really rhetorically effective question. I think the most important line out of that clip I just played is when he asked the question, quote, when in the course of human evolution did we get these souls or spirits, end quote. Now, a question is not an argument, um, and so I've, I've been thinking about how could I steel man this in order to come up with an argument, and what I came up with is uh, the argument you see on the screen. This may be overly generous to Zimler, but um, this is, I think, at least in the spirit of what he's trying to say. Premise one, if Christianity is true, then at least among terrestrial organisms, all and only human beings have souls. Premise two, if Christianity is true, then human beings differ in kind from their closest ancestors. Premise three, if evolution is true, then human beings differ only in degree from their closest ancestors. Premise four, evolution is true. And therefore five, Christianity is false. In my opinion, this second argument is much better than his first. It seems to me, however, that premise three equivocates between evolution and unguided evolution. If unguided evolution is true, then human beings differ only in degree from their closest ancestors. But Christianity is logically consistent with guided evolution. If Christianity is true, maybe God used guided evolution to produce human beings by giving them, but no other species, souls. Now, again, I'm not saying I personally believe this. Rather, I'm just saying I think the issue is more complicated than Zindler acknowledges. For this reason, I think his defense of what I'm calling the anti-insolment argument is, at best, incomplete. I think there is a better argument lurking nearby, however. In fairness to Zindler, it wasn't available in 1991, but it's worth introducing it here anyway. I think that For this, I'm going to turn to Purdue University philosopher Paul Draper. Let the abbreviation FL stand for facts about the flourishing and languishing of sentient beings. According to Draper, these facts are as follows. One, the majority of living things, including the majority of sentient beings, never flourish. Two, many more flourish for only a very small portion of their lives. And three, almost none who live a full life flourish for all of it. Using FL, Draper constructs the following evolutionary argument against Christianity. Premise one says that biological evolution provides a reason to doubt Christianity. Allow me to explain. If indifference naturalism is true, evolution pretty much must be true. But if theism is true, then evolution might be true or special creationism might be true. So, everything else held equal, the fact of biological evolution is more likely on the assumption that indifference naturalism is true than on the assumption that Christian theism is true. Premise two adds facts about flourishing and languishing into the equation. Even if we compare what I'll call evolutionary naturalism, which is the combination of indifference naturalism and biological evolution, to what Draper calls Augustinian Christian theism, he calls it that because Augustine famously denied special creationism, it says that known, it being premise two, says that known facts about flourishing and languishing are much more probable on the assumption that evolutionary naturalism is true, and so Augustinian Christian theism is false, than on the assumption that Augustinian Christian theism is true. Why? Why should you or anyone believe that? Draper makes three points about the predictions of Augustinian Christian theism. First, on Augustinian Christian theism, quote, human beings and other sentient beings are supposed to flourish, end quote. Second, quote, sentient organisms have a good and no sentient organism can achieve that good without flourishing, end quote. 
And third, quote, a God being perfect in moral goodness could not care more deeply about sentient beings achieving their good and being perfect in power and knowledge could not be better positioned to ensure that sentient beings achieve their good, end quote. And thus, Traper concludes, FL is extremely surprising given Christian theism. In contrast, he argues, evolutionary naturalism provides good reason to expect FL. The combination of indifference naturalism and evolution predicts not just common descent, but natural selection as the principal source of complexity in the living world. Furthermore, he writes, quote, natural selection, and in particular survival selection, cannot operate unless there are winners and losers in the struggle to survive and reproduce. Thus, Draper concludes, in the absence of supernatural assistance, a Darwinian world containing sentient organisms is very likely to be a world where early death, languishing, and suffering are common. Premise three is an intermediate conclusion which follows from one and two. It says that the combination of evolution and FL is much more likely on naturalism than on Christian theism. The intrinsic probability of a proposition is its probability when we abstract away all extrinsic factors like evidence and explanatory power. When we do that, the only thing left to consider are, is rather a proposition's modesty and coherence. Premise four says that prior to inquiry, indifference naturalism starts out with an advantage over Christian theism because indifference naturalism is both more modest and more coherent than Christian theism. Premise five is another intermediate conclusion. It follows from premises three and four. It says that by itself, the evidence of evolution combined with the evidence of FL is very much more probable on the assumption that indifference naturalism is true than on the assumption that Christian theism is true. Premise six should be straightforward. Indifference naturalism and Christian theism are mutually exclusive, which means that they cannot both be true. If indifference naturalism is true, then Christian theism must be false. Finally, the conclusion seven follows from five and six. Other evidence held equal, the combination of evolution and FL make it very likely that Christian theism is false. I've given Zindler's presentation of this argument a positive rating. From a logical perspective, I gave him one up arrow, but I think it could be strengthened and be worthy of three up arrows. From a rhetorical perspective, I gave him two up arrows. The argument is easy to understand, and I suspect a lot of people will be, will be persuaded that Christianity more strongly predicts a historical Adam and Eve than a non-historical Adam and Eve or a metaphorical Adam and Eve. Fifth, Zindler claims that Christianity is so human-centric, so conceitedly human. Elsewhere, he says that if Christianity is true, then the entire universe, quote, out there is just for us, end quote. But cosmology shows that the universe is at least 12 billion years old. Again, he's debating in 1991 and the Earth is at least 4.5 billion years old. If the universe really were just for us, this isn't what we would expect at all. And therefore, the age of the universe, or the scale of the universe, is evidence against Christianity. This is a variation of an argument that is now known as the argument from scale. I agree with Zindler that the book of Genesis certainly gives the impression that God created the Earth for humans, but I think Zindler makes a leap of logic when he says that Christianity teaches that the entire universe out there is just for us. I don't see why a Christian could not believe that God created intelligent life on multiple planets or even on multiple planets in multiple universes. Perhaps Jesus has died multiple times, once for the sins of humanity and then other times for the sins of extraterrestrial life on other planets. Granted, the Bible never claims any of this happened but it also doesn't seem to rule it out. My own view is that a different version of the argument from scale, one that argues against God's existence, is a logically correct inductive argument, but in the weakest way possible.
For the reasons just stated, I think Zindler's version of the argument from scale has not adequately been defended, and so I rate it with one down arrow. I think it could be repaired, however, and be worthy of a single up arrow. From a rhetorical perspective, I thought Zillner's presentation was very persuasive, and so I gave him three up arrows. In conclusion, I'd like to offer the following overall assessment. Regarding the overall structure of his opening statement, I've argued that Zindler did not select the strongest objections available to him in 1991. Furthermore, he spent too much time on his introduction, time he could have spent instead on further developing his arguments or by adding a conclusion to his speech. Finally, the amount of time Zindler spent on his individual five objections to Christianity was not proportional to their logical or rhetorical strength. From a rhetorical perspective, I thought Zindler was a good speaker who was funny, easy to understand, and likable. But Zindler hurt, not helped, the public image of atheism with his terrible response to Craig's moral argument. From a purely logical perspective, I think there were serious problems with every one of his scientific arguments against Christianity. I've explained how at least three of his five arguments could be repaired, the argument from the variability of Christianity, his points about evolutionary biology, and the age of the universe. But even in their repaired form, none of these arguments directly address the alleged resurrection of Jesus, which is the most important Christian doctrine of all. I want to be clear that atheists don't have to be interested in philosophy or biblical scholarship. But if you're going to debate whether Christianity is true, then you've got to do your homework and actually engage with essential Christian doctrines. I don't think Zindler did that. For that reason, I don't think his case against Christianity was compelling or complete.